Hey, good morning, everybody. Jeff Slakey and Spencer Hughes here on the Daybreak Show. We're going to have a very great detailed conversation here this morning. It's actually going to lead us into a Facebook Live event with Mason Health on Tuesday at three o'clock as we talk about COVID-19, the vaccination process, and how Mason Health has been working to vaccinate the citizens of Mason County. I'm happy to have via Zoom right now, Dr. Dean Gushy, the Chief Medical Officer for Mason Health, and Dr. Nicole Eddins, the Senior Director of Ancillary Services, who both have received doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to talk with you. And I know that uh, you guys have been involved in this for uh, almost a year now with uh, ongoing conversations. And the information has changed uh, so much from back to March to where we are today. And it's exciting to know that the vaccine is in Mason County and it's being distributed. Uh, As I mentioned, you both have received it. Did you feel or have you uh, noticed any side effects? Well, I, I can speak to it uh, very limited, really. You know, if, if you get an annual flu shot, you usually get a little soreness in your arm, and that's the bulk of what I've had and I and what I've heard from, you know, the thousand plus people we've vaccinated, the, the side effect profile has been very good. And in fact, even better than what they saw in the initial studies around this vaccine. Oh, I think we see a few more uh, side effects with the second dose, as you would expect. And that's a good thing because it implies that you're developing that immune response. Things like feeling tired, I think, has been a common complaint, back with the arm pain again, and maybe some low-grade fevers, but it doesn't last long, and it's not uh, unpleasant, and people are functioning just fine. We've not seen really dangerous side effects that, are, that were reported very, very sparsely in the, in the studies. Nicole, you? Yeah, like uh, Dean mentioned, um, I, you, know, you definitely get a sore arm from it the next day, just like you do any vaccine. Um, The first dose was very tolerable for myself. And the second dose, I was definitely feeling pretty lethargic the next day, but you know, nothing, nothing you can't plug through. Um, uh, Like you mentioned, it's just our immune system uh, making antibodies and making memory cells that uh, will fight it next time it sees it. So it's definitely worth it. When we talk about Mason Health and is a key in our community for this vaccination process, How is the process been going? How many folks has Mason Health been able to vaccinate? So at this point, we have vaccinated over a thousand people and uh, very excited to keep expanding that. Um, We're we're kind of vaccinating roughly anywhere from from 50 to 100 people a day. Um, That's a combination right now of staff, of healthcare providers outside of Mason Health, of uh, our local EMS and firefighters, and then also our long-term care facility. So everyone in phase 1A is who we've been vaccinating right now. And Dean, that phase 1A, how is that, um, how is that described for the population? Well, it's, it's really those uh, healthcare workers is, is really, think about it that way, and first responders. So it's people who would be in very close contact with uh, you know, uh, high probability patients with uh, COVID. So the intent was to get all of those folks vaccinated so then they could continue to stay healthy and take care of COVID patients before expanding it out to the rest of the population. And obviously it's dependent upon having available vaccine. So we recognized early on that we would have enough vaccine to do our entire um, 1A population here locally um, for both doses. And uh, now, needless to say, we haven't had everybody willing to take the vaccine. Everybody, There are people who legitimately are wanting to see what's going to happen because it's new and that's perfectly fine. But I think as time has gone on and they've seen the success we've had and the low side effects and all of that sort of thing, uh, more and more of our own employees are choosing to get the vaccine. When it comes to after the first dose, and then through the time before you get the second dose, you still need to maintain the same precautions that a a non-vaccinated person in the community has, right? You still need to maintain the social distancing, the masking, washing of hands and things like that? That's correct. The the rationale there is that when they did these initial studies, they looked at um, people who developed COVID symptoms. So symptomatic COVID symptoms after getting vaccinated. And we know that that was a very low number What they didn't look at were people who maybe still got the the virus but showed no symptoms, which is a fairly common thing with this particular disease. 
And so until we have more experience with the vaccine and really understand that end of it, the, the logical and reasonable thing to do is to continue all of those precautions so that just on the off chance that you might be carrying it, you're not spreading it around and continuing to protect the population. And then after the second dose, is it still recommended to maintain those policies? It is for that same reason, until we really understand better the performance around uh, asymptomatic, uh, potentially asymptomatic carriers. Nicole, the, the trials and the uh, uh, creation of this vaccine happened at a, at a rapid pace and, and they're still learning more, of course. Do we have any sense of what the immunity, long, long shelf life of this immunity will be uh, for a, a human? At this point, we don't, uh, and, and that's uh, you know why we're going to continue masking and social distancing, and that's also why it's recommended for those who've had COVID, who've been COVID positive, to also get the vaccine, is because we don't know how long their immunity is good for. Um, I think the the um, with time we will learn that though, and and they'll they'll continue to release that information. With these vaccines, it creates the the antibodies, and I and I remember hearing back early in the summer as as people were using the antibody bodies, perhaps for other studies. That's with the the COVID uh, COVID nineteen itself. Is it the same with these? After you get the vaccine, there's a potential for someone to, I don't know, help use their blood in a test for something else. Do you know, you know I've, not, I've not heard of anybody uh, or of anybody recommending that they begin harvesting um, antibodies from patients who have been vaccinated. So people who didn't have the disease. That certainly is a stopgap measure. I think the use of those antibodies and what we'll see going forward is a lot less of that and uh, a whole lot more of the vaccination program. The vaccination program really is the way out of this thing. There really isn't another um, lesser alternative. In, uh, you see a lot of different groups. You mentioned first responders as being in the first group, and there are other industry-specific groups that are starting to be added to these lists. Uh, I am a mid-40s male with no real underlying conditions who lives in a uh, with my wife and son. Uh, when would this? When would I be able to be vaccinated? Well, I can show you the state's plan. If you'd like me to go ahead and share my screen on yeah. that right now, it's probably good timing. So here is the state's plan and this is what we are following. Um, right now we are currently in 1A, uh, uh, 1A1 and 1A2, and that's basically healthcare workers, um, EMS, uh, long-term care facilities. So if you look through this, you could see the, the different categories of 1B, 1B1, 1B2, 1B3, and where you would fit. So, so Jeff, for you particularly, you know, you wouldn't fit in 1B1 or, or 1B2 because of your age, but in 1B3, depending on your comorbidities, um, you know, those 16 years old or older with two or more comorbidities, something like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, would fit into this category. Now, that being said, uh, what I wanna let everyone know is this is an estimated time frame. <clears throat> excuse me, this is an estimated time frame. And so we are, are you know, hoping uh, that basically it will just keep moving forward, but I, I can't, you know, say for sure, okay, on March 1st, this will start. So I wanna just give everyone that heads up that, but this is the order that we're gonna be following. And as the governor releases this, we'll be following suit. I see on the screen there mm -hmm. that website, find yourphasewa.org. Uh, that's definitely something that most that everybody should go to check out to not only for their own peace of mind, but then to share with the rest of their families uh, as well. Now, I do see there on B1, 50 years or older in multi-generational households. And I know that there was some recent changes just in the last few days about this. Can you share what those were? Yes, I can. We had a, a great collaborative call with our, our uh, local hospital, uh, our, our local hospital organization, and they helped share this too, because the multi-generational household can be very confusing. And so this is a screenshot of something I, I literally just got last night. Um, so it looks like those, those who are 50 and over, but are not able to live independently. So if they're receiving long-term care from a caregiver, um, they're living with someone who works um, outside the home or for those who are 
over the age of 50 and living with and caring for a grandchild. So not just a child, but a grandchild. So that's what they mean by multi-generational. Dean, I know you've been on the uh, calls uh, with uh, incident commands and area commands throughout the time here, and there's always a lot of conversations that are going on. And we spoke about it a little bit at the beginning, uh, some people's uh, apprehension to getting this uh, vaccination. And there uh, are a lot of conversations out there in the world about this vaccine and, you know, theories about what it does and, and what it doesn't do. And I don't see a arm growing out of your head here yet. So I guess that's an okay one. What are some of the main things that you'd like to let people know that this is a safe vaccine and, and some of those conspiracy theories are pretty unfounded? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a, it's a very revolutionary approach to developing a vaccine. It's not new technology in the sense of, of that this is the first time ever to use it. This has been in development for other reasons for about eight years, as I understand it, largely around cancer research, where there may be some real breakthroughs with this same technology into the future. Um, it, it, it does not, one of the things I've heard is uh, because it's an mRNA vaccine, I've had some people ask me whether or not it changes your DNA. And the answer is it does not. It has no interaction whatsoever with your DNA. It actually go, doesn't even get into the nucleus of your cell if you wanna get into the details. It goes to another part of the cell where it then begins churning out these um, protein uh, antibodies. And that's all it's doing. Um, it, it, it also is um, recommended by the American College of Gynecology for Pregnant Women. And they've looked at the data in very closely and have recognized that the risk versus the benefit is much, uh, much favors the benefit of the vaccine over the, over the potential risk. There have not been any reported problems in pregnant women. Uh, no, no problems in women generally, there's no impact on your fertility. That's another thing that we've, we've heard from time to time. Um, there's no basis for that whatsoever. Uh, and there are no microchips uh, in, the, in the vial. If you look at the, the size of the needle that's used, those would have to be some pretty amazing microchips. And if you sucked them up out of the vial, you might get all six of them in a single dose. So <laughs> there are no microchips. I have seen those and it is a, it's a very small needle. It's a tiny uh, needle, yeah. So not only as this was um, independently verified and, and gone through with the FDA, the, the Western states banded together as well to also... Um, independently certify this as well. What is, what does that, what extra layer of uh, certainty or comfort should that give somebody? Well, it's, it's a, it's an extraordinary step. And I think it, it was a very cautious and very uh, scientific approach to looking at the data. So, you know, what they wanted to do was to be able to assure the public and, you know, the, well, the public that, that the vaccine is safe. So not only did the FDA uh, go through their own approval process, which is really generally quite uh, thorough. Uh, the Western states, as you point out, put together an independent board of epidemiologists, virologists, vaccinologists, people, scientists who do this sort of thing to look at the data very critically with an independent eye and make their own determination as to whether or not this uh, was really safe and effective. And they all and they came out with uh, with obviously safe and effective and released the vaccine for use. One of the other things that we hear about is the is the herd immunity, and that it, you know, if a majority or a majority, a larger majority of folks get this vaccination, perhaps COVID won't be able to find its way through those folks to the people who haven't been vaccinated. Is that really uh, something that we should be hanging our heads heads on, or should, do we we all need to go out and get the vaccine? Well, it, it, when you talk herd immunity, the, the point is that the, you want to get the vast majority of the herd immune. And the way to get immune with this is to get vaccinated. So once we have a critical mass of folks who've gotten vaccinated, we will have that herd immunity. You can look at other diseases like uh, mumps and measles where uh, by and large the population has been immunized. And you can see where it fails, where you have populations of folks who choose not to get vaccinated, and then that's where you get outbreaks, that, that herd immunity fails because the herd is no longer immune. The uh, natural trial of this was in Sweden, where they decided to take an approach where they basically put no, no uh, precautions in place, hoping that they would get a significant proportion of the population infected and therefore immune. What they found, though, when they went back and looked at that data is that, in fact, they had a relatively low uh, rate of immunity 
uh, even after allowing it to run for months and months. And all they got out of it was a lot of hospitalizations and a higher death rate. And so what that tells us is that this vaccination approach, this two-dose vaccination approach, very well studied, shows very good immunity. Uh, this is the way out of it. And natural disease probably doesn't provide sufficient uh, protection, which is part of the recommendation for people who've had COVID to get vaccinated because having it, had it is not enough. Nicole, talk to me a little bit about where folks can head to Mason Health and the website to find out how to sign up, get yourself uh, registered to be on the list to get the vaccine. Yeah, Jeff, our website is definitely the best place to point to. Um, we, we are vaccinating, like I mentioned, anyone in phase 1A. Um, we do have uh, plans, uh, big plans for a uh, drive-through vaccination clinic that's going to be on the 30th. Um, more details to follow once we, we uh, hear from the state of when phase 1B is going to be released and also um, uh, you know, time and location. All of that will be on the website. We're, we're, you know, what I'm going to um, ask for is that everyone realize that we still have patients to care for. We have COVID positive patients in our hospital. We have our clinics very busy handling day-to-day -day health needs of, of our community. And um, we, we are trying our best to vaccinate each and every person in the county. Um, that being said, there's 60,000 plus people in the county and we have limited resources to provide this. So everyone's patience is, is greatly appreciated. If it is not your phase right now, it will be soon. And we cannot wait to vaccinate you. So if you could just be you know, patient until you wait, you, you land in that phase and there is an email address for those who are in the current phase. So those right now in phase 1A uh, can, can email covidvaccine at masongeneral.com. And we will get to you as soon as we can to schedule uh, your immunization. I'll put that uh, email address as well as the links to that in the show notes here. Again, a reminder coming up on Tuesday, we're going to be doing a Facebook Live. Well, we'll cover a little bit more of these similar questions, but then a whole host of others and have an opportunity for you to uh, ask questions as well via the Facebook Live and the, and the comment system there. Again, on the Zoom call this morning, Dr. Dean Gushy, Chief Medical Officer for Mason Health and Dr. Nicole Edens, the Senior Director of Ancillary Services. Thank you so much for spending some of your precious time with us this morning here to answer some of these questions. And I look forward to Tuesday to kind of getting through this a little bit more. Thank you. Thanks, Very much Jeff. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.